In section 11.2, we're going to be making inferences about two means, but this time it's going to be for independent samples as opposed to dependent samples, which is what we did in 11.2. And this will mean a different process, a much trickier process actually than what we were doing in 11.2, because 11.2 was basically the same as chapter 10, but a little bit gussied up with D bars and stuff like that in it. But in this section, it's going to be a little bit more complicated because the groups are independent of each other, which you'll notice is part of this piece right here. That's the newer piece for chapter 11, which is that we have to prove that the samples are independent of each other, which is two separate groups. Actually, let me write separate groups measured once. Right, these are not matched pairs. These will be random people that have nothing to do with each other, and there'll be two separate groups of them, and they'll be measured one time. Now, the rest of this, the sample independent of the population and the normal piece, that we've done before, we just have to do it double time. So we have to do it for both group one and for group two. And same thing with the normal here. You either have to prove that both sample sizes are greater than 30, or you have to have a graph for each of the samples to prove that they're, each of them is normal with no outliers. Now, if you look at your null and alternative hypotheses here, again, in chapter 11, it's a little bit easier than chapter 10. We don't need another number. You just assume automatically that the two groups are equal to each other, which another way to write that, I'm just going to mention it, would be that mu1, oh, sorry, for h0, mu1 minus mu2 is equal to 0. Sometimes computer programs like this version, sometimes they use this version, so it just depends. As a matter of fact, the TI-84 uses this version over here, whereas StatCrunch uses the version on the right. So it, it either one is fine, they both work. And then, of course, you would have to change your alternative hypotheses accordingly. Then we do the rest of this, but you'll notice just as in 11.1, I gave us a big caveat here. We're not going to go find this formula by hand. It's just kind of a pain and there's no real reason for it. We're going to make either the TI-84 or StatCrunch do it for us. We need those values in order to find the p-value anyway, right? We don't find the p-values by hand. We use technology to do it. So technology is going to be doing some heavy lifting for us when we run the hypothesis tests for this. Speaking of which, let's go do a hypothesis test for this. All right, so we want to test whether there is a difference in the body temperature of men and women. We collect a sample, a random sample, excuse me, of 65 women and 65 men and take their temperatures. And yes, this is real data. Um, this has actually been something that's being studied over the last 20, 30 years. As a matter of fact, very intriguingly, there's evidence that our average body temperature is shrinking, that it's going down in, in industrialized countries with um, good medical care. And there's some speculation as to why that might be. So this has been a hot topic of study for a bit. So the first thing we're going to do is verify our conditions. Same thing as verifying requirements, same thing. So step one, random. Well, that was easy. <laughs> random is given. It says right there. <laughs> so this is a yes, it's given. Um, I'm actually going to put step two right over here just to kind of give myself some room here. And that would be the independent samples. And that's definitely the case. These are two separate groups of individuals that have nothing to do with each other. So two separate groups and they're measured one time. They're, they put a thermometer in them and they measure their body temperature. So two separate groups measured once. Okay, step two is done. Step three, I need to know that the samples are independent of the population. So let me write that. Samples independent of the population. Okay, this is one of the hardest parts because we have to prove that N1, um, which I'll do up here. So this is group one right here. So I need N1 to be less than 0.05 capital N1. And then I need N2, which is right here, to be less than 0.05 capital N2. But this is not going to be too bad because N1 is 65. There's your sample size right there. These are your Ns. 
And that is certainly less than 0.05 of all women. Similarly, 65 for men, right? Here's N2, here's N1, in case you want to know. And that is definitely less than 0.05 of all men or all males. I was kind of not clean with my language here. Actually, just to clean that up, I'm going to change it to women and men throughout the whole table. I'll change this piece too, just to make it clear. All right, so we have 65 is less than 5% of all women, 65 is less than 5% of all men, so this is a yes, right? So this is a yes, of course. Done with that. Oh, and I forgot to say yes up here. We have yes right there. And then last but not least, we need normal but this is actually going to be pretty easy. And that's because our sample sizes are large. So we need N1 to be greater than or equal to 30, and we need N2 to be greater than or equal to 30. But that's not difficult because they're both 65. So 65 is bigger than 30, 65 is bigger than 30. So we have a big yes here. All right, so we have random, independent, independent, and normal. So we have all four pieces written out. So that's these pieces right here at the top. And of course, we only do those if we're being asked to do them, but we were specifically asked to verify the conditions. So that's the same thing as requirements. And we've got it done. Now it's time to really run the test. So we want to know whether, uh, let's see, Conduct a test of the differences in the mean body temperatures between women and men. And we got to look for a phrase that gives us our test. And it's right at the very beginning. It says we want to test whether there is a difference between um, in the body temperature of men and women. So by saying that, that means that we want to, down here, have step one, the mean for women is equal to the mean for men. You just assume that is the case. And then the alternative would be that the mean for women is not equal to the mean for men. And that comes from the fact that they say there is a difference. So that's a not equal to. Now I put women in front, by the way, because women are group one. So because women are group one, I'm putting them in the lead down here. So women, men. Now, step two would be that alpha is 0 0.05. Now, before I go any further, I do want to make a note, because this might matter to us when we get to stat crunch, that we can write those hypotheses in another way. So you could write them like that, that's fine. Or you could write it as mu for the women minus mu for the men, that's group one, that's group two, is equal to zero. And the alternative would be mu for the women minus mu for the men is not equal to zero, right? Those are our two values because you'd be subtracting the mean for men from both sides. You don't really need the ones and twos there, but I'm just reminding you that the women are group one, the men are group two. All right, so now step three. Well, remember, the beautiful thing about step three is that I wrote right in there that I just want you to use technology. I don't want to see this formula. It's too much of a pain to write out anyway. So we're just going to get this from technology. Now we know where to go on the calculator. So let me go there first because it says right on the previous page that we're going to do a two SAMP t test right there. And then StatCrunch will see in just one second. So if I grab the calculator, I go to Stat, I go to Tests, and I go to two SAMP t-test, it's number four. And I grab it. And I don't have data in this table. Um, data, it would be a table of data for the men, a table of data for the women. I'd have 65 entries. I don't have that. So I have to go to stats. And then I enter all my values. I mean, it's as simple as that. So group one was women, so that's 98.394. The standard deviation was 0.743. N was 65, and then for the men it was 98.105, 0 0.699, and 65. And we're doing a not equal to, so just do that. 
And then the pooled thing, you might want to write a note about that. We always leave pooled at no. Um, to make pooled yes, you would actually have to do a whole other hypothesis test. Uh, six whole steps first before you get to do these six steps. So we always leave it pooled at no. And you can see the test statistic is that T value. It's 2.284. So you get that out of the calculator. Okay, a couple things. One, back on this sheet right here, you might want to make a note that pooled is no. So when it asks you for pooled, always leave it at no, which should be the value that it's on anyway. All right, let's go see how to do this in stack crunch. So that way we can write some instructions for ourselves. So when we're in stack crunch, we go to stat, T stat. Ah, there's two samples. So we've used every one of these, just thinking about this. One sample we used in chapter 10. Sometimes we do with data if we have a data table, or we do a summary if we just are given the statistics like the X bar and so on. We did paired in section 11 too. Paired was when you have the differences, and so you have to run a test on the differences between two dependent groups. We are in two sample right here. Now with data would mean, again, we have a data table for each of the groups. So 65 body temperatures for men, 65 body temperatures for women. We don't have that. So we're going to click with summary instead. All right, so we click with summary and then we type in our values just like we did before. So group one was the women. So 98.394, then the standard deviation is 0.734, or 743, excuse me, 743. And the sample size was 65. Then we have 98.105, 0 0.699, and 65. Always leave pooled variances unchecked. See that? If you check them, then that's doing this whole other test that we're not covering. So you leave it unchecked always. So you want to make it so pooled variances is no, right? Just like it was on the calculator. And then stack crutch is indeed using the zero part. So we want equal to zero, not equal to zero. That's perfect. If you would like a p-value plot and summary statistics, you're welcome to check them. You don't have to. That's just optional. So I click Compute. And you can see the test statistic is right there, 2.284, just like the calculator gave us. And then there's the p-value, which we need for the next piece. And then these are the sample statistics, which we already knew, in case you're interested. And then there's the graph. Hey, that's the graph we need for the next part. That's the part for step four, although not with those huge lines. We won't put those in there, but that's the idea. Okay, so where did we go? On our stat crunch, we went to, and pooled is still no, pooled is unchecked on stat crunch. But we went to stat, T stat, to sample. I can't tell you any more than that because sometimes you'll go with data, sometimes you'll go with summary. Just depends on what the problem you're, you're doing has. So our problem was everything was summarized for us. They gave us the X bars right here, they gave us the S's right here, and the N's right here. So that's all summary statistics. So we used with summary statistics, right? With statistics, with summary. If we have data, then that would be a different story. Okay, so down here for step four, we actually just saw the picture. It's a T-curve, and it's technically a T-curve with 60, well, the degrees of freedom is not 60, it's, it's complicated, <laughs> let's just leave it at that. But nevertheless, um, we have a T-curve, and it has two tails drawn and shaded. This T0, which is that line right there, is negative T0 in absolute values, which is negative 2.284. This is positive absolute value T0, which is positive 2.284. That's the symbols that are written for you right on the sheet. It says, put negative absolute value T0, positive absolute value T0 right there. So just write it like that. The absolute values just ensure that the negative value is on the left and the positive value is on the right. That's all it does. And you can see right in there, look at that. And notice that degrees of freedom up there, by the way. That is the degrees of freedom. It's 127.525.
and some change. Yes, you can have decimal degrees of freedom. It's not something we covered. Um, we're kind of ignoring it. It's in this section if you want to read the textbook. All right, so you have this graph. The p-value is the area in the two tails, which is 0 0.024. So the p-value, it's both tails put together. So you write it up here and say it's 0 0.024, and you put two arrows because it's automatically both tails. All right, step five. Our p-value is 0 0.024. Our alpha is 0 0.05. Since that p-value is less than that alpha, we will reject h naught. We reject h naught when the p-value is low. And the lower the p-value, the better it is for us. More statistically significant. There is sufficient evidence to support the claim. that there is a mean, well, I guess I could just say this, a difference in the average body temperature for women, men and women, or women and men. And there we go. And that, of course, we learned how to do back in chapter 10 to write the script out for um, how to write a conclusion. And then we're writing out H1, and the H1 was back up here. There's a difference in the body temperature for women and men. That's what we just proved there was sufficient evidence to support that. And there is, actually. Um, this is real data. These are real data. So these, this was from a real study.